Okay, so this is God's Word to the World Church Fellowship and College. It's an educational environment in which we promote biblical thinking and spiritual awakening, and we're your hosts, Eddie and Sue Hyatt. Eddie's topic tonight is Silent No More, setting the record straight about 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. His notes are available in two places. One of them you see there on the screen, God's Word to womenblogspotcom slash 2017 slash 09 slash silent dash no dash longer dot html. And I read that for the sake of those who are going to be listening to the audio only version. God's Word to Women Blogspot.com 2017 09 Silent No Longer, but also go to eddiehyatt.com. And Eddie, I'm not sure how people find these notes on your website. Uh, I can give, I, I will put the, uh, the link right here, Sue, on the uh, on live stream, and also I'll post it on the website there where we're streaming. We've been, uh, we're celebrating our 10th year of live streaming weekly started on a Tuesday night in Tulsa, Oklahoma, out of our home with one notebook computer and one little old camera. And God has just helped us to, to become better and better, and we're not through yet. So here are some announcements. I first of all want to let you know that Eddie is available to minister in your church or fellowship. You can reach him at Hyatt at gmail.com. D-R-E-D-D-I-E-H-Y-A-T-T at gmail.com. I just want to recommend uh, two of his courses, two of his books, uh, and he can uh, teach these in one session in your church or fellowship, uh, or he can extend it to as many as you would like for as much detail as you want to have. The first is Pilgrims and Patriots, and uh, he's available to minister uh, with that. It's excellent not just for American believers, but also for Christians in other nations because there are key elements there that are very enlightening. The second one that I want to recommend at this time that Eddie is available to minister on is Paul Women and Church. And again, you can contact him at Hyatt at gmail.com. His uh, 10 lesson course is available at GWTW Christian Women's Hall of Fame.com and go to then to college. And I see, no, well, there are a few people on, but not too many chatting yet, Eddie. Mm -hmm, right. So we welcome you and we uh, encourage you to let us know you're there. Now, should you lose the, if you are on the Facebook live stream and you lose it, you can always go to the livestream.com, our channel, our, our live stream channel. Uh, and there it is on the screen. And this is tonight's session, 7730968. So this is God's word to the world, church, fellowship, and college. And we have four main purposes here. The first purpose is to bring hope and healing through biblical thinking and spiritual awakening, not through developing codependent people, but helping people to get on their own two feet and realize that the same Holy Spirit is in them that is in any believer, and that Holy Spirit and the Word of God together can bring hope and healing. Purpose number two that we have is to provide a safe place of fellowship, sound teaching, prayer, and praise. Purpose number three is to teach all that Jesus commanded, as he said in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And purpose number four is a distinctive, a commission that God has given us to teach the truth about biblical manhood and womanhood and biblical relationships. And the biblical truth is this. The Bible teaches the equality of women and men, men and women, in terms of substance and value, privilege and responsibility, function and authority in all areas of life and leadership, ministry and marriage. Now here are a few announcements, further announcements. Great news. 
our friend Dr. Victor Coretti translated 10 things Jesus taught about women into Swahili. And then he raised the money to print the book in his homeland of Kenya. Now, Dr. Coretti does live with his wife, Eileen, in Toronto. He is formerly a lecturer and specialist surgeon at the University of Nairobi. On a recent visit to Kenya, he had the books printed in a town called Kitali, uh, which is about 400 kilometers from Nairobi. And we are working with him now to help develop a distribution plan. And here is the cover of the printed book. There it is, there it is, and here's a stack of them. They are on their way now from, uh, no, they're still in, they're, they're staying for the most part in Kenya. That, it was easier to print them in Kenya and to distribute them throughout Africa. That was much less expensive and easier than, than having them printed here in North America and then trying to ship them there. Uh, but he is sending, uh, I requested just a couple of copies, one for myself and one for the Hall of Fame. And so those will be coming soon. Um, Eddie, uh, can you tell us just a little bit about Swahili and its importance? Oh, uh, Sue, so yes. Uh, when, uh, w when we learned this was going to be studied in Swahili, I did a little research on it. And I was surprised it's not only spoken in uh, Kenya, but it is spoken uh, through quite a number of nations throughout Africa. It would be spoken by millions of people in Africa, by millions of Muslims in Africa. And so uh, this is such an exciting uh, event. This is such an exciting thing to see your little book, 10 Things Jesus Taught About Women, being in this language. Because when God drew me to get on board with you about this message, He spoke to me very clearly and said, this message has the power to begin a mass movement from Islam to Christianity beginning with the women. And now, if there's anybody out there who uh, wants to help Dr. Victor Coretti print more of these books to get them out, you know, we'll, we'll keep you informed of, of, of what happens there and so on and how they get distributed. Uh, really, Eddie, I have been really blessed that uh, Dr. Coretti has been able to um, mobilize some of his Kenyan friends yes. and others yeah. mm -hmm. to raise that money because I explained to him that we are not in a position right, right now to sure. do that. So that's why I've been so encouraged that he yeah, has absolutely. done that. Okay, so I see here that Edie in Halifax is on. Edie, watch the weather. I see that, um, is it Marie or the hurricane prior to that is on its way up the East Coast and could skirt Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, she says, I don't know how long I'll be on because I haven't been feeling well today. Well, Edie, 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 God bless you, dear friend. And Linda Miller in Tulsa says, okay now, on the chat and so happy to see everyone. I'm thrilled to see 10 things in Africa. I must tell Judith and others I know. Yes, do, Judith Riza. And uh, I believe her husband speaks Swahili, so we'll be eager to get a copy to Judith and her husband. And Sue, so, uh, maybe I can find it. There was a really good um, note from somebody I don't think we know in Africa in response to this on your Facebook page. Did okay, you see it? Okay, you go ahead and find it while I continue with the yes. uh, announcements, okay. okay? Okay, so further announcements from the Hall of Fame. And here's the Friends and Partners Report for today, September 19th, 2017. You know, here at the Hall, we inform, we inspire, and we instruct. And here are a few Grapevine Festival, Grape Fest photos that we, we had a great time. It's an annual event here in Grape, Grapevine. The crowds did come, there you see them. And we were blessed. I, I really need to put that one up on the, the large screen. I think I will do that. Just give me one minute. I need to put GF1X up on the screen. There we go. Okay, so there's Irene. Uh, she, her approach was to go out on the street, out, out in front of the hall, and uh, 
she had me make up just a little f small flyer to give people and I was so impressed she reached out with a big smile and with this little piece of paper and she would say we're new here and we just want to let you know what we do and people were very responsive and uh, that was so good and so there she is and you'll see on the left the, in the left side there the picture on the left you'll see the little Sonos player because we it finally dawned on us that we could also pipe music, praise music, outside on the sidewalk where people were passing by. Nobody seemed to be offended and many were blessed. And here she is as the day wore on and the temperature soared to the high 90s. She sat across under the, the shade tree and there's the, um, the sandwich board that we had letting people know that we were open. Now, Eddie was a great blessing. Here he is writing during a slack moment, but at one point, Valerie Owen was with us hosting, and there on the, the right is Olina Helen Oziogi. Eddie, is that correct? Uh, I believe you're very close to it, Sue. Yes, now, uh, Helen was a great blessing here, too. She is, um, wow, she is a professor at Dallas Baptist University, a native of the Ukraine. And she was a student of mine at Christ for the Nations. A student of Eddie's at Christ for the Nations a few years ago and uh, now enrolled in Regent. And she and her husband are resident here. He's a native of Nigeria and has a, a very uh, prosperous business downtown. Um, and they have three young children. So. Um, I was so happy to meet Helen. This was really my first time to meet her, and uh, we had great dialogue. And then uh, I was uh, able to give tours. I would ask people, "Did you come in just, you know, did you come in for a bottle of water because we we know it's hot out there, or would you like the five cent tour?" And most of them were here, came in because they really wanted to know what was going on. So I would give them a brief tour, and here I am couple more pictures. One of the ladies in the picture on the left is taking, uh, has just started um, an online degree at Liberty University and the lady with the black hair has just moved here from Durham, North Carolina and she's looking for a church. And here we are, these are locals from Arlington. A mother with her tall niece and her shorter daughter it was so good to have the young people coming in and we had some great times with people who came in and I would bring them through and some of them would just sit down at the table. I know one lady, Debbie, uh, from uh, McKinney, she said, oh, it's so peaceful here. And uh, so we sat and we talked probably for an hour. It was great. Now here are a few upgrades since last Tuesday. I was able to p uh, put a uh, Quaker poster up with uh, the book there at the bottom of the screen, just let me take down the overlay. There, 1666, the first book written showing, giving the argument that the Bible teaches that women should, can, and must have the responsibility, in fact, to speak and not be silent. So, Margaret Fell wrote her book while she was in prison, Im imprisoned, incarcerated for her faith in England during that year, 1666, and she wrote her book. What a great way to get a book written, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, she did not waste time. And then here is another one, Where Are My Susannas? And most of you know the story there. And this is the seating area. and. Um, the video area and the reading room and it's just so comfortable and I, I know people will be in have a drink of tea or coffee or cold water and sit down at, with a good book uh, and to or to watch video there. Um, now Joe Martin's uh, presentation, the Joe Martin collection, I really want to get the lettering up over it and um, so if anyone feels to contribute toward that Right now, the lettering is on sale at Hobby Lobby and Michael's, uh, but it would cost about $100, and I just don't have that to lay out right now. Same is true with this. Somewhere in the gallery, I want to see in big letters on the wall, informing, inspiring, instructing. But to do that is going to cost about $40 a word. Back here, 
it's going to cost about $50 to put the reading room and the video room up so that people will, when they come in and they're browsing, they will know what the purpose of that place is. So if you can help with those, feel free. Um, I believe you know where to go to contribute to that. Uh, and it will be, if I can get that on the screen quickly, let me see, for those who may be interested in helping, where you can go to help with that. Any of those? Okay, uh, here we go. To donate to any of these or to become a uh, monthly partner or to give a one-time gift, here's where you can go. GWTW, Christian Women's Hall of Fame dot com slash donate. So we are making progress. Hallelujah. Making progress. Okay, so Eddie, I believe those are all of the announcements. So do we have, do you have something there that you wanted to read? Well, yeah. Uh, uh, Sue, Sue, Sue Wood, she and Tom are back from Iowa where they celebrated Tom's sister's home going. And uh, it was so interesting. She, uh, Sue is pointing out his, uh, his sister it was in her 90s. Really? And um, his sister's name was Irma. And uh, Sue says Irma's entrance into heaven was the same day Hurricane Irma entered Florida. And one caused great, caused havoc, and the other brought great celebration. That's <laughs> so good. Anyway. Anyway, that's good, Sue. God bless you. And um, uh, Linda Miller is saying, uh, she's saying, Margaret Fail is another woman who I'm very interested in, along with Lillian Thistlewaite and Army Car Amy Carmichael of India. And, oh, yes. Uh, Linda, so glad you're with us All tonight. All right. Well, Linda, I Tulsa, know you're Oklahoma. a very busy lady, but you go ahead and pull those together, and we, whenever you're ready, we'll, uh, we'll have the place ready for you. Something else, Eddie? Uh, that was it there, Sue. Okay. I, I'm on, you I think, said that you had a good email from Africa. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. It wasn't from Africa, but it was some people are very excited about uh, the uh, book, your book being in Swahili. Right. Uh, and were commenting and very excited about it. Great. Yes, I'm excited too. When I wrote that little book, I had no idea that it would be translated. If I had known, in fact, if I had sense enough that, to know that it was going to be translated, I would have written it in much simpler um, sentences. But anyway, they seem to be doing fine. So it's now in Spanish, French, Swahili, as well as English. Okay. Well, let me see. Um, Oh, Sue, Sue Wood, Sue Wood. We have a bookstore here, and we really, really, really want to be able to make your book available to people who come in. So I don't know if we need to pick them up from you or if you and Tom would like to come up and see what's here and, and bring some of those and put a price on them, and we'll give all the proceeds to you. Uh, that's a great book. Your story is very inspiring. Uh, it's a real joy to read, and uh, so we want to make that available. So uh, just let us know how we might arrange to get those here into the, the, the gallery. Edie Hicks, Jose is going to miss us except for a bit of rain. Well, that's good, Edie. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So is Rhonda on tonight? Yes, Rhonda's over on Facebook, I oh, believe Oh, Rhonda, so. you're monitoring Facebook. That's wonderful. And Eddie, it looks like you are monitoring live looks, stream. This yeah, is how I've, it looks. I've been having a little interaction here on live stream. All right, so great. So those two are looked after. And if there's anything I need to read, will you give me a heads up? Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Now, uh, just to rem I, I don't know who has come on since we gave the announcements, but the uh, let me just just switch to this for and one Sue second. And Sue Wood says she just said we were talking about Quakers. Uh, Margaret Fail. She says, Tom's ancestors were some of the first Quakers to enter America. Wow. Wow. Okay, and she says, uh, okay, right. Okay, uh, Eddie's topic tonight is silent no more, and the notes are available at that address. You see that on the screen? Go ahead, and um, if you want to get those notes, print them out. This is a good time. Or you can get them after he's through. 
Um, I just wanted to say too that Eddie is available to minister in uh, churches and home groups and I'm especially promoting his Pilgrims and Patriots Revive America. He does an excellent job. He just recently did three sessions uh, in the 11 o'clock session at Christ for the Nations. Very blessed time. And also his book, Paul Women in Church. He has a 10 lesson course, but he can teach that in just a few lessons. Now, you know, I was, uh, we were able to, oh, there's Irene. Hey, welcome. Your microphone, please come and get your microphone before you sit down. I was just showing pictures of you giving out oh, okay. the little things and uh, telling them what a great line you had. You said, we're new here yes. and we just want to let you know that we're yes, here yes. and you're welcome to come in. Okay. Your microphone is there on that chair. Okay, well, Irene's getting wired, and uh, Eddie's taking care of live stream, and I'm, and Rhonda's taking care of Facebook. I want to read. Let me just make sure that my mic is on. Okay. I want to read the preface that I wrote for Eddie's book, Paul, Women, and Church. Here goes. God, why do you hate me? asked a young lady when she read the translation of Paul's words in 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. She was a new believer from Romania, and she was studying the New Testament after having recently accepted Jesus as her Savior and Lord. And when she arrived at Paul's writing, she was stunned by what he seemed to be saying about her as a woman. It was so different from the acceptance and joy that faith in the Lord Jesus had given her. And so she was confused and actually demoralized and said, God, why do you hate me? Well, thank God she was enrolled in one of Eddie's courses in Bible college and heard the truth. The truth that you will read in this book, this little book, Paul, Women, and Church. Uh, witnessed with her heart and revived the life of the Spirit in her inner being. No more confusion, no more condemnation. Whether we are willing to acknowledge it or not, this woman's experience of suppression and subordination is repeated in the lives of most Christian women with varying degrees of intensity. That is to say, what we experience in the spirit is so opposite from what we are told that the Bible says about us as women. This is the fault of ill-informed church leaders who willingly take Paul's writings out of context and impose ideas opposite to what Paul himself believed, lived, and taught. It's the fault of, tra of traditional translation and interpretation informed by the pagan thesis that women are evil, inferior, unequal, and unclean. Contrary to this is the biblical thesis that men and women are equal in terms of substance and value, privilege and responsibility, function and authority in all areas of life and leadership, ministry and marriage. This is what Jesus taught, what creation teaches, and what the Holy Spirit has taught throughout church history, both individually and in the hearts of true believers and corporately through Holy Spirit revivals. It's also what Paul teaches in his epistles correctly understood. Now, Eddie has extended and deepened my own biblical, theological, and historical research in this area, strengthening our understanding of the biblical truth. I'm thrilled. Like me, he's been willing to risk rejection, slander, and misunderstanding to proclaim the gospel in all of its fullness for the sake of God's people in his kingdom. Eddie first developed the material in this book in a 10 lesson course by the same name. From the beginning, it was clear that he needed to capture the findings of it in book form, and now he has done it. I know the good fruit will be abundant and will remain, setting free the captives from traditional lies propagated by an ill-informed church and various socio-religious cultures. This book comes at a critical time in history. From the time of the Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther's proclamation of the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, a gradual restoration of the biblical message and the gospel of Jesus Christ has been occurring. 
After centuries in the dark Middle Ages, the Reformation brought light by putting the Bible in the hands of the masses with leaders like Martin Luther, George Fox, introducing a social model in which boys and girls were educated and taught to read so that they could gain knowledge of Scripture and develop biblical lifestyles. Scripture in the hands of believers gave the Holy Spirit substance with which to work and from that beginning of reform have come revivals, each of which has restored a strategic biblical gospel doctrine. Now is the time that God, through informed study of Scripture and the ministry of the Holy Spirit by highly educated believers, is restoring the truth of biblical equality, and we are honored to do our small but strategic part in God's big plan. As you read this important Bible study, allow the Holy Spirit to birth a greater sense of personal responsibility in you and to awaken new hope in your spirit and soul and to fulfill your reason for His having given you both life and new life. As you do this, men will find freedom from ungodly, the ungodly load of responsibility imposed on them by unbiblical teaching while women will find new freedom to walk out God's will and purpose. You will discover the joy of functioning not on the basis of gender roles defined by fallen religious culture, but rather according to the leading of the Holy Spirit in accordance with your natural and spiritual giftings, your unique given God-given personalities, and your eternally important God-ordained purpose and commissioning. If you are truly serious about being a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, this book is for you. Amen. Well said, Sue Hyatt, if I do say so myself. Okay, we uh, can shift gears now because I would love for more people, Eddie. I, I just, I can't let it go. I, I just am so excited that people who came to in here uh, for Great Fest, they received that book as a gift. Yeah, with, and, with joy. And people were really excited about what they were seeing here. Uh, there were different people sat down here uh, on two different situations. There were people who sat here, I think, for at least an hour talking. And one person, one, one group there, the person who was kind of leading the group said, it is so peaceful here. And uh, so anyway, it was, uh, it was really great to, uh, it was a blessing. to have that exposure. Hi, Paul, Kenny, and Eileen. Oh, by the way, Daryl Newman, our friend and tech expert, uh, is leaving tomorrow. He and Eileen, I, Yvonne rather, I'm sorry. He and Yvonne, his wife, are headed for the UK where he is going to be in charge of all of the video, television, um, broadcasting of the big soccer tournament, world soccer tournament or whatever it is mm. that they're having there. And uh, so that's pretty exciting. It is. Daryl is a real expert. He is a genius oh at yeah, this yeah, stuff. He's, uh, we are but, so But blessed. here's what, what's exciting. God has given he, us he, he, he gives us free input along the way, which for other places would cost $100 an hour. He's given us free input and consulting. But he is also, Sue, when he is with us here the last time, he offered to come over and do a class on operating the TriCaster free of charge. He would come over. We could invite anybody who, who wanted to learn how to operate the, the studio, the TriCaster. And uh, he would come and he would teach a class on operating. So if you're in the uh, area here, and you're interested in learning how to operate a TV studio using this particular equipment and the TriCaster, which is a very, it's, it's new technology but becoming very popular. Uh, Daryl Newman, who is one of the experts in the field, will come, hands, over, will come over and uh, yeah, conduct a free we seminar for us. We haven't set a date though because our schedule is so full, but that's something that's coming down But we the need road. to let people know so we could, if people could let us know if they're interested. Right. Anybody in the area, if you could let us know you're interested, that would be very helpful. So when the time comes to do it, uh, we'll, we'll know who to contact. Okay, I see Janet Dishman is on Roku in Tulsa. Hi there, Rhonda. I see you're looking after things there. Um, Helen Warmoth in Broken Arrow. Good evening, Helen. Right back at you. And Delilah and Charles. 
and others are joining. Okay, and Paul Kenny says, uh, Paul, are things, oh, I see you asked if things are getting back to normal in uh, Houston. He says, for us, the flood is over. Many people in our area are still trying to recover. Okay, well, God bless them. And the people, man, there was a terrible earthquake just south of Mexico City today, 7.1, right, Irene? Yeah, and uh, I noticed on Facebook, uh, Wayne and Martha Myers, their daughter, checked in and said they're fine. Oh, that's good. Now, Eddie, if Valerie were here, she would say, you know what she would say mm -hmm. to you? What would she say? Well, that's that's okay. No, no, you for Valerie's sake, you tell her. Tell us. Oh, oh, oh Valerie doesn't like me to put my hands up in front of my face. <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie, are you going to be teaching from your computer tonight? No, I'm not. I, I will close right. it when, when, when that time when comes. When you're ready to, to teach, then let's stop. Yeah, all well, right. well let's, let's pray no, just, for... No, uh, would you wait just a sure. minute? Yeah. Would you wait just a minute? I want to go to camera number four. I wasn't sure who would be here tonight, but I set things up just in case. And I'm just wondering, Irene, do you have any... Um, let me just see if you're, what your... Your microphone's much too far away. Can you bring it right up? In fact, you could actually put that on your on your blouse just like I am. Okay. I know your mom is uh, in the hospital with a stroke yes. so you might want to tell us and just let me, I don't know, I better just leave it as so for now. Okay, test it Irene, talk to us. Testing. Go ahead, talk some more. Testing, one, two, three. All right Irene, mm. it's all yours, you have Okay. Before. Well, I have a mother in British Columbia, 93 years old and she had a mini stroke but I've had a dear friend call and pray um, the scripture of John ooh, ooh, what was it John 6 I think that, that we could uh, pray and remit her sins so that she could receive Jesus before she dies and so my heart and prayers have always been to pray for her salvation and my friend has uh, agreed and I'm so excited because I believe that might have been um, a way for my mother to receive from the Lord more clearly in these difficult days that she's in the hospital alone a lot and will be for two more weeks. Wow. Eddie, would you pray for Irene's mother? What's her name, Irene? Her name is Norma. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up Norma. And Lord, there is no distance with you. You're everywhere. And is, is Norma in the hospital right now? Yes. Lord, in that hospital room, there are Christians there. We ask you to send labors across her path. Send Christians across her path that will speak to her yes. the words that she needs to hear. Yes. And Lord, we pray that you will make yourself known to Norma in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and that she, Lord, will come to know you as her Lord and Savior. Yes. We thank you for doing it, Heavenly Father, yes, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just pray for, uh, we just pray that everywhere this stream goes tonight, that your healing presence and power will flow. Lord, and uh, we do pray that, that you will touch Norma's body. Bring her out of the hospital. Touch her in a way, Lord, that she will know that you have intervened in her heart and life. Yes. We ask it in Jesus' name, and we thank you for doing it, Lord. Amen. 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 Okay. I'm going to close my com Irene, is, there else that, is there anything else that you would like to share? Are you, when are you going to see her? Um, I'm hopefully leaving flying out of Denver on September 30th. I'll drive to Denver and bypass the fires. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. No smoke, no fire. And uh, I should get, be there for a couple of weeks or three weeks. Sure. And um, I have a lot of brothers and sisters that I'm very excited to go see too. So, oh, right. yeah, okay. so I'm pretty excited about that. You've worked hard. You, uh, you're ready yeah. for this. Yeah, Good. I am. Good. Okay, Eddie, Thank you. Are you ready to go? Hey, I, I am ready. Thank you all for joining us tonight. This will be archived and trusting that this will be shared with just hundreds of thousands of people all over the world setting the body of Christ free to function fully 
every member functioning fully according to the unique gifts and callings of each one. Uh, so, so, Lord, we just pray that uh, these words will go forth and your truth, as you said, will set the captives free everywhere this message goes in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. When you read it, it sounds very clear, unmistakable. Paul said, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as also the law says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Uh, based on that clear statement, uh, that has been used with one other passage of Scripture to uh, confine women to one degree or another uh, throughout Christian history. Now, I have studied this passage of Scripture for over 45 years. I've read numerous commentaries and theories about this Scripture. I have taught this in, on a college level in, in more than one school. But only recently have I come to a complete settledness inside that I have an understanding of what this Scripture is all about about. And that's what I want to share with you. Now, there are different approaches that people, I'm not going to go into those. If I was teaching this in a college somewhere, I would go into all of the different uh, approaches, the, the different answers people have given, but we're not going to do that. But I'm going to say there are other approaches that have value. I know our friend, our late friend, uh, Dr. Catherine Crager, who was a pioneer in this whole area uh, of the gospel and uh, of equality in Christ and interpreting scriptures in light of the gospel of Christ. Uh, she highlighted, because she had studied classical Greek history, the mystery religions of that time, which were very prominent in Corinth, and how many women were involved in these and how they were so wild and, un, un, and uninhibited in the worship in these, uh, these false religions and uh, they would shriek and scream. Uh, there were immoral acts in them and so on. So Kathy Crager was pointing out that Paul most likely was addressing this problem in the culture. And Corinth was considered the most immoral city in the ancient pagan world. In a world of paganism and uh, immorality, Corinth was considered the most decadent of them all. In fact, there was a word that was coined that meant to act like a Corinthian. And it was used throughout the Roman Empire of a very decadent and immoral person. They were said to be acting like a Corinthian. And so Corinth was not a nice city a very decadent city. But I'm not going to go into all of those things. I'm going to go to the heart of where I have come to and why of why I'm completely settled in my heart about what Paul was saying when he spoke these words. And I'll just say up front, I am convinced that Paul did not speak these words, that he is actually quoting what the Corinthians had said to him in a previous letter they had written to him. And I will show you the passage in a moment where Paul specifically says that he's responding to the letter that they had written to him. And I'll show you other places where he specifically quotes things that they have said in order to respond to them. But before we go there, let me mention a couple uh, of principles of biblical interpretation, also known as hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is simply principles of biblical interpretation. And there are principles for interpreting any kind of literature. And if we do not bring some common sense principles of biblical interpretation, you can 
pull scriptures here and there, and you can make the Bible say anything. You can come up with any kind of outlandish theory just about that you want to by picking and choosing and pulling verses from here and there and, and combining them together. You can come up with just about and, and prove just about any kind of theory you want to. So here are a couple of principles that I want to leave with you tonight directly applicable to this. Never, never, never build a doctrine on one passage of Scripture. I'll say that again. Never, never, never build a doctrine on one passage of Scripture, especially a Scripture like this that is so out of character with the rest of the Bible. We must compare Scripture with Scripture in coming to our conclusions of what we believe that the Bible is saying. And so, so that's my first principle of biblical interpretation. Never build a doctrine on one scripture or even two scriptures if, if they're both out of line with the whole biblical message. That is why we need, especially the New Testament, we need to have a sense of the spirit and the overall message of the gospels of the New Testament not taking one verse out and building an entire edifice on one verse. And so that was the first principle, never build a doctrine on one passage of Scripture. Secondly, understand the context of the passage at hand. And I don't mean just the textual context. You know, this passage has a context of the verses above it and around it, in fact, the entire letter. And remember this, chapters and verses were not written by Paul. Chapters and verses were not here when the Corinthians read this letter. Chapters and verses did not come along until the 13th century. And it's amazing how, you know, the person that came up with a chapter and verse division, sometimes that they're, they're divided right in the middle of a sentence. And the chapter and verse divisions are very helpful in the sense of it helps us find references. It helps us find particular areas of Scripture. But they are very detrimental in the fact that it makes it easy to pull a part of Scripture out of its context. It makes it easy to memorize one verse and then make that one verse the basis of your belief and pull it out of context. So it makes it easy to pull things out of context. But not only do we need to understand the context of what's written around a verse and the entire letter that it's a part of, we need to understand the context of the situation in which that letter and that passage was written. Now that, that is just so important, the context. We can call it the historical context, or you could call it the life setting. What was the life setting of Paul writing this passage? What was the life setting of him writing this letter? Well, we know from the letter itself that Paul was answering a letter that they had written to him, and we know that he responds to things they have said and that times he even quotes things that they have said in order to rebut what they have said. Now we're going to get in detail with that just a little bit later, but first of all, I want to mention three, or may, I'll say four, glaring problems with this passage of Scripture if it is taken at face value. I'll say that again. Before I get into the, the passage itself and, and looking at it, and there's one little Greek word that is so very telling about this passage. But before we go there, and this is in the outline, I want to mention four glaring problems with taking this passage at face value. And the first problem with taking this passage at face value, is that it would violate even the freedom that women knew under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. Women were not silenced in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a few examples. Miriam 
was a prophetess. She's called a prophetess in Exodus 15 and 20. What is a, a prophet or a prophetess? A, a prophetess is just a, a, a female form of the word prophet. Is a person who speaks in the name of God, who speaks on behalf of God. And Miriam is called a prophetess. Not only is she called a prophetess in Exodus 15 and 20, but in Micah 6, 4, God was speaking through Micah and God said, I sent to you Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. God himself said, I sent three individuals to bring Israel out of Egypt's bondage. Who were the three sent ones? Moses, Aaron, and their sister Miriam who is also called a prophetess who spoke God's word, who spoke in the name of the Lord. So Miriam was not silenced. She was called of God to speak. Here's another one. Deborah, later on, Judges chapter 4, two, two whole chapters about Deborah, Judges 4 and 5. She was both a prophetess and a judge. She wielded both spiritual and civil authority. Interestingly, she had a husband. But in two entire chapters about Deborah, her husband is mentioned in one verse just in passing. And so she was a woman leader, both civilly and spiritually. She had great respect. She was also the commander of the Israeli army at the time because she called Barak, the commander of the army, and commanded him to take 10,000 soldiers and to go out against, I believe it was the Amalekites. And she had such respect that the army commander refused to go unless Deborah went with him and with the 10,000 soldiers. They refused to go into battle without her. <laughs> And so she went with them, and God brought about a tremendous victory that day. There is no inkling of any kind that Miriam or Deborah were acting out of bounds in any way. No. They were called of God to speak. There is no indication of any woman being silenced in the Old Testament. And then there's Huldah later on during the reign of King Josiah. She was a prophetess who had great respect among the leaders of Israel. And when they had problems, they sent for her to tell them what she believed God would say to them. She was not silenced. There is no silencing of women in the Old Testament. There is nothing in the Old Testament about women being silent. And so if Paul's statement here is true, then women had more freedom under the Old Covenant based on law than under the New Covenant based on the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And that is totally unacceptable. How could women under the Old Covenant have more freedom than women under the New Covenant? But that is what we are faced with if we take this one passage at face value because women were not silenced under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. So that's one big glaring problem if we take this passage at face value. And by the way, when you come across a passage you don't understand or it seems like it's out of sync with other passages of Scripture, the best thing to do is just don't deal with it. Put it aside until God grants you further understanding. Secondly, the second glaring problem with this passage, if it's taken at face value, is that it would violate how Jesus related to women. Jesus had many dealings with women. He never silenced a woman. In fact, he encouraged them to speak. Even There's a very interesting thing, and this is number one under B on the first page of the notes, a very interesting thing that came to my mind when I was preparing this. When Jesus was taken as an infant, and this is in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, when Jesus was taken as an infant 
to be presented to the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem, there was an aged prophetess named Anna who was in her 80s. And Luke says she did not depart from the temple, but was there day and night spending her time in fastings and prayers. And when she saw the Christ child, she began to speak and declare and to speak to all who would listen about this child that had just recently been born concerning the redemption and, and his place in the, in the redemption of Israel. So here is a woman in the temple in Jerusalem declaring to all who will listen about this child that she has just seen and knowing that there is something significant about him and God's promise of redemption to Israel. So here are women speaking here at the very beginning of Jesus coming into the world. Jesus had many women disciples. You can read about these in Luke chapter 8. He also encountered women in his ministry. One of the most interesting ones is in John chapter 4. The woman at the well, at Jacob's well. And Jesus talked to her. And to show the prejudice that was in Jewish culture at the time, his, his male disciples had gone into a village to get food. And while they were gone, Jesus struck up a conversation with this Samaritan woman who had come to draw water. Later on, when his male disciples came back, John says that they were amazed that he talked with a woman. Because as Sue has pointed out in her books, both the one that is translated, just translated to Swahili, uh, 10 Things Jesus Taught About Women, but also in the larger book, which Sue, you have just received a release from the Spirit to get that back in print. And I say hallelujah. In the Spirit We're Equal, she shows from quoting uh, uh, Jewish rabbinical sources how that it was considered, in Jesus' day, it was considered beneath the dignity of a rabbi or teacher to speak to a woman in public. But here's Jesus carrying on a conversation. And when his male disciples came back, it's, John said they were amazed that he was talking to this woman. They would never stoop to such a thing. Oh, but Jesus, he, he came to change things, didn't he? But here's the thing about this woman. Jesus said to her, because he wanted to bring things more out into the open. He said, go call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And, and he said, well, to that point you're telling the truth because you have had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And at that point she said, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> you know, he's telling her things there's no way he had a knowing. And, and, and they have this conversation which there's so much powerful stuff in the conversation. I would like to go off on it, but we've got to stay focused here tonight. And she got so excited. By the way, this Samaritan woman who's had five husbands and is living with a man that is not her husband was the first person to whom Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah. I want to say that again. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't James. It wasn't John wasn't the high priest, wasn't Pontius Pilate. It was this lowly, demeaned Samaritan woman, but obviously whose heart was open and hungry spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to see past the outward facade of people and their situations and see where they are on the inside. And apparently Jesus saw that there was great potential for this woman. And so he revealed himself to her as the Messiah. She got so excited, she left her water pot, ran into the village and was, was telling everybody, she says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And she said, is this not the Messiah we have been looking for? Because the, the Samaritans, they were a mixed race. They had Jewish blood in them. And so they too were looking for the Messiah. And she said, is this not the Messiah? Come see this man who told me everything I did. This must be the Messiah we have been looking for. And the whole village came out 
based on her testimony to see Jesus. Well, did Jesus try to silence her? No. Hey, if there was ever anybody Jesus would want to silence, I think it would have been this woman. But no, he didn't even silence her. If Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 is taken at face value, it flies in the face. It totally violates how Jesus related to women. Jesus never silenced a woman. And then there is Mary Magdalene. When Jesus comes out of the tomb, the gospel writers are explicit that he appears first to Mary Magdalene and sends her forth to be the first preacher. He doesn't silence her. He gives her a commission to speak, to be the first preacher of the good news of the resurrection. Wow. And sends her. He didn't call her to a women's ministry. His first commission was for her to go tell the men that he was alive. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you, you know, we could ask questions here. Jesus was in his resurrection body. He could have, he could have appeared first to, to, the, to Peter and James and John and the twelve, but he purposely did not. He purposely appeared first. He purposely required that the men disciples hear about his resurrection first, not from him, but from a woman disciple whom he purposely appeared to first and sent her forth, and I'll say it again, not with a women's ministry, but to go and tell the men that he was alive. There were many women in Jesus' circle of disciples. Uh, just go and read Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. But there is not the least inkling. There is no indication anywhere that Jesus wanted to silence women. The whole spirit of the Gospels is that Jesus advocated for women's rights, for women's equality, and he purposely sent women like Mary Magdalene to speak in his name on his behalf. So if we take Paul's... If we take Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 at face value, you're going to have to build your doctrine on that one passage, and you're going to have to reject the Old Testament. You're going to have to reject the Gospels. You're going to have to reject Jesus. And that's not very smart. The wisest thing to do, if you're not ready to accept something different, is just put that passage aside and wait until you get some further understanding. But here's another thing it flies in the face of. C on the notes. If we take this passage of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 at face value, it would violate the promise of Pentecost, of Joel 28, 32, which was fulfilled in Acts, which we'll read those passages in a moment. But in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 32, Joel said, he spoke of a time. He said, It shall come to pass afterwards, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And on my servants and my handmaidens. Did you notice? He, he, he makes a point. Now, Joel says God is speaking through him. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So this is a, a coming time that does not exist in the time of Joel. It's coming. And he says, what will be significant about this? Sons and daughters will prophesy. Servants and handmaidens. And by the way, those are in, in the Hebrew and in the Greek, those words are very similar. It's, it, one is a male servant and the other is a female servant. So on my male servants and my female servants, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. He makes a point to couple men and women together. Every time they're mentioned in this prophecy, 
in this promise of Pentecost, I call it, men and women are coupled together that they will experience the, 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 the empowering of the Holy Spirit and as a result, they will prophesy. They will speak by the Spirit of the Lord. We know that this promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And this is so important and powerful. We've got to go back to and read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus had told his disciples, all of them, the men and the women, to wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Here's something very important. We know from Paul's testimony, in, also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus, in one of his post-resurrection appearances appeared to over 500 individuals. And, 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 and it would have been men and women. He appeared to over 500 Adelphoi. And Adelphoi, the, the older translations translate Adelphoi's brethren. The newer translations translates it brothers and sisters because uh, research into uh, ancient Greek literature has discovered that Adelphoi was a word used to address both men and women. It's interesting, Jesus told over 500 of his followers to wait in Jerusalem until they were in, endued with power from on high. But for some reason, only 120 obeyed that command. My friends, I'm probably speaking to people, and I know most of I'm speaking to tonight, and I don't know who all I'm speaking to tonight, but I, I know some of you, and I know I'm speaking to many. We have heard God speak. We have walked with Him. We have heard Him speak. But are we fully obeying and following through on everything He's told us to do? Jesus told over 500. He appeared to over 500 in one of His post-resurrection appearances. And I have to assume that they all received his command to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. But on this day, at this time, there's only 120 responding. But notice in uh, Acts 1 verse 14, says these all, this is in the upper room, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Who's the women? It's all these women who came from Galilee, also women from Jerusalem. Those who were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb on resurrection morning it would include Mary Magdalene and so many others who, who were followers of Jesus. And so these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And, and, and that word is Adelpho and we know that Jesus had half brothers and sisters and so this would be his brothers and sisters. So there are, there's quite a few women here in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They are all there together. They're not in segregated seating. They are all there together. And what happens? Look at chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all. Who's all? All of these men and women, disciples, followers of Jesus. They were all there. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Oh, you mean it didn't just sat on Peter? <laughs> or just on Peter, James, and John? No, it sat upon each 120 of them because the ground is level at the cross. Hallelujah. And the ground was level there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And now this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And it shall come to pass afterwards, saith God, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And on my handmaidens and my servants and my handmaidens, on my male servants and my female servants, I will pour out of my Spirit and they will prophesy. This is what's happening. And so the Holy Spirit comes. They are all filled with the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire sat upon each of them. Verse 3, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Then they were all 
Everybody say all. 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 Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Wow. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't hold it in. This is what Jeremiah was saying. Jeremiah was one of those Old Testament prophets that was filled with the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was contained and confined to only special people, prophets and kings and judges, for special times at special places. But here is the wonder of this new covenant brought in by the coming of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. Now the Holy Spirit is being poured out on all of God's people. Hallelujah. Oh, Jeremiah, what I was going to say, Jeremiah got so much persecution when he would speak forth the word that God gave him that he decided, I'm not speaking any for me anymore in your name, Lord, because every time I speak in your name, all I get is trouble, attacks, and opposition. So I'm not speaking forth. I'm not speaking any words you give me anymore. But in spite of that, God gave him another word. You know, sometimes God pays no attention to us. He gave him another word, and, and Jeremiah tried to hold it in. But he said, it became like a fire shut up in my bones, and I could not hold it back. Am I speaking to anybody out there? You feel like you've got a fire shut up in your bones? Oh, that's what happens when we're filled full and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And it, and it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's because God wants you to begin to speak forth in His name and on His behalf. And so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and all began to speak and to praise and worship God in other tongues. This was the empowering of the church. This was the empowering of God's people and it is both men and women. And if we take this one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 34 and 35, if we take it at face value and, and, and you say you're going to put it into practice in your church or whatever or in your life, then you may as well throw out the Old Testament, throw out the Gospels, throw out the book of Acts, and just have that one little passage for your Bible. Because that's what you are left with. Oh, my friends, powerful stuff. The Word of God is so wonderful. Okay, the fourth thing I want to mention, just before we go to the passage itself. The fourth thing it would violate would be what Paul has said in this very same letter about women praying and prophesying. In chapter 11, verse 3, Paul acknowledges that women pray and prophesy in the church at Corinth if for cultural reasons in Corinth they wear a head covering. Now, I am not going to go off in that. That's another thing. But... He acknowledges that men and women, I'm sorry, women pray and they prophesy in the church at Corinth. And then go over closer to this passage, to chapter 14. Let's start reading at verse 26. We're, and, and here we're almost to this passage. In verse 26, he says, How is it then, brethren? By the way, that is Adelphoi means brothers and sisters. There were a lot of women in the church in Corinth. How is it then, brothers and sisters? Whenever you come together, he says, each of you, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Then he says, if anyone. Notice he uses inclusive language talking about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in the church gatherings, which would have been in many different houses in Corinth. This was before the building of church buildings. And so the church at Corinth would have met in multiple houses throughout the city. And so this is why there could be such congregational involvement with each one having a, a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, interpretation. 
And then he says, if anyone, so anyone might bring forth a tongue, speaks in a tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and let one interpret it. And then look at verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak, and that is functional language because this is now post-Pentecost, God's Spirit upon everyone. Everyone has the potential to speak forth a prophecy. And so this simply means if anyone has a prophecy, he's not referring to an elite group of prophets. He's referring to if anyone has a prophecy, he would call them a prophet here, let two or three prophets speak, let two or three people who have a prophecy speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. And then look, look at verse 31. This inclusive language is what I want you to see. For you can all... So this verse 31 is a comment, an elaboration on verse 29. So it just indicates that he's talking about anyone in the congregation having a prophecy. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So the fourth thing is if we take this passage at face value, not only is it out of sync and out of character with what we know of the Old Testament, it's out of sync and character with Jesus. It's out of sync and character with the promise of Pentecost and what began to happen with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's even out of character with what Paul has written in this same letter. Now, we're going to go, we're going to, now we're going to put the cap on this. We're going to nail this. Let's go to the passage itself. We must remember, now coming to this passage, verses 34 and 35, we know in the context of the whole of Scripture, this can't be taken at face value. There's got to be a deeper meaning to this. I can remember my mother saying many, many years ago, she's been gone to be with the Lord many years, her reading that passage and saying, I wonder what that means. What it really means, what it really means because now she didn't have all this information I'm giving to you tonight, but she knew things. She knew my father had been saved under the preaching of a powerful woman evangelist. And in the early Pentecostal movement of which she and my dad were a part, there were many powerful women preachers, evangelists, pastors, church planters. And so when she read it, it was like this doesn't fit with my experience with God. <laughs> I wonder what this really means. Well, here's what we're going to come to right now. What I believe, I am completely settled that this is what this really means. Now remember, I mentioned this earlier. Paul, in this letter, one thing he's doing, he's responding to a letter the Corinthians wrote to him. Turn over to chapter 7 in this same letter. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, he says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Ah, mm -hmm. now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Oh, they have written Paul a letter. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have that letter. Not in existence. Be nice if we had that letter to see what all they said. I'll just throw this up front. I think in that letter they stated to Paul, what he repeats back to them in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. And here's why I believe this. He says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So now I'm going to address some things you wrote to me about. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. There is widespread agreement among New Testament biblical scholars that this statement, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, is something the Corinthians have said. And Paul is here repeating what they said in order to comment it on it now and to give them his response to their statement. Now, there is evidence that throughout this letter that Paul quotes things they said, maybe some statements or slogans they have. 
And here, he specifically says, now I want to respond to some of the things you wrote to me about. And one of them, you said, it is not good for a man to touch a woman. And then he begins to elaborate and to give his answer to their statement and their question. Now, let's just look at a couple of places where Paul very clearly quotes things that the Corinthians have said. And one of them is in chapter 1, verse 12. He says, now I say this, that each of you says. Now he quotes what they're saying in order to rebut it. Now this I say that each of you say, I am of Paul, or I am of Paulus, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. So here Paul is repeating things that they have said. And then he elaborates on and tells them why they're wrong in what they're saying. And then there's one over in chapter 3, verse 4. For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? And so again, he quotes what they have said. Verse 7, I'll read it again. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me about, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Chapter 12, he says, now concerning, which is another way of introducing his statements about spiritual gifts, probably answering things they have said about spiritual gifts. And we know that any time spiritual gifts are being manifest, women always come to the forefront. I mean, this is obvious. Sue has shown this in her book, In the Spirit We're Equal, which, by the way, is available on Kindle, on Amazon on Kindle. And I've, I've shown this in my book, 2,000 Years of Charismatic Christianity. Anytime there's a revival of the Holy Spirit, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit does not discriminate on the basis of sex. He does not discriminate. So he pours out his spirit on both men and women that in any kind of Holy Spirit revival, women come forth as proclaimers of the gospel and so on. And so I would say they have had questions about spiritual gifts probably because women have been coming to the forefront and that goes against pagan culture and even Jewish culture that would fly in the face of it. And so they've got questions about this and this statement comes in the context of questions they have had about spiritual gifts. Now here is the key, I believe, for sealing the fact, it has for me, that Paul here quotes something they have said in this letter. And again, I have shown you that in this letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul throughout is responding to things they have said. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read this. Chapter 14, verses 34, 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Now at the beginning of verse 36, I'm reading the New King James, it has the word or. That is a very poor translation. It is a little Greek one-letter word, a. It looks like, sort of like a, an English written in. But it is a little a. Now, it can have different uses, just like the English word fast can have different uses. It can mean to go quickly. It, means, it can mean to hold securely, to hold fast. It can mean to go without food, to go in a fast. It depends on the context where you're going to use it. One of the uses of this little Greek word A is what Greek scholars call an expletive of disassociation. An expletive of disassociation. Like the word nonsense. Somebody says something to you and it's so far out. You say, rubbish, nonsense. 
an expletive of disassociation. Different parts of the country and different parts of the world have their own expletives of disassociation. Now, Sue, I think this one was unique to New Brunswick because I don't think I had heard it before. Of where, uh, if somebody heard something that just seemed to them far up, they'd say, get out of here. <laughs> and I remember our friend Madonna, who was a Texas girl, <laughs> and she and her husband Chuck was up working with us, and she, she was talking to the manager of the apartment they lived in, and Madonna must have said something, that, you know, that was kind of, uh, this woman just kind of thought it was, was out there, and this woman said, get out of here, you know, and Madonna thought she was telling her to get out and to get away. <laughs> or, or the New Yorkers say, forget about it. <laughs> forget about it, okay. <laughs> hey, if some of you have a unique local expertise of disassociation, we'd like to hear about it. Now, I brought this out. This is a, the, probably the most massive Greek-English lexicon out there. Verily highly regarded. The Little, H.G. Little and R. Scott Greek-English lexicon. Very exhaustive. I looked up this little Greek word A in it. It gave the various meanings of the word. One of the meanings it gave was, for this word, was an exclamation of disapproval. Now that's sort of like the same thing as an expletive of disassociation. Little and Scott call it an exclamation of disapproval. Like the English nonsense. Like the English rubbish. I find it very interesting and compelling to my heart and my mind, especially since this verse is so far out of character with Jesus, with the Gospels, with even the Old Testament, and with Paul in other places. With Paul in other places. No wonder at the end of this statement, he puts this little, <laughs> this little Greek word that is used as an exclamation of disapproval according to Little and Scott's Greek-English lexicon. An exclamation of disapproval. Rubbish. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> That's what Paul puts at the end of verse 35. Wow. I have no... To me, this settles the matter. It puts this verse in context. It makes it harmonize with the rest of the Bible. It makes it harmonize with this letter. And it even put, fits within the context of this letter where Paul is answering questions that they have written to him in a letter and where throughout he quotes things that they have said. Wow. Now, he uses this little a, this exclamation of disapproval, in this letter in other places. Let me show you at least one. Chapter 6, verse 1. And again, he's dealing with something that he is very unhappy with these Corinthians about. You know, they have all these cliques. One says, I'm of Apollos. Another, I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a charismatic. You know, and Paul is very unhappy with all these divisions and cliques. And it is so severe that they're having quarrels and they're taking one another to court and going before pagan judges. And Paul, to Paul, this is a terrible Christian witness that you Corinthian followers of Jesus, that you can't settle your own problems and your own disagreements, that you're going to pagan judges and getting them to rule about your quarrels and your disagreements. 
And in chapter 6, verse 1, remember this was not in chapters and verses when Paul wrote it. And he expresses his frustration and disagreement with them for doing this. And he says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. And then he puts that little A. In some translations, it translates it at or. But that is a poor translation that diminishes it. Little and Scott says that it, one of its uses is as an exclamation of disapproval. And when Paul says, dare you, having a matter against another believer, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? And he says, hey, like certainly not. What a terrible thing for you to do. Hey, what a terrible thing for you to do. And so there's another place where he uses it here. There is one writer who has identified a whole array of places where Paul uses that little a in this very same way as an exclamation of disapproval where he is so frustrated with the Corinthians and what they're doing and what they're saying, he uses this little exclamation of disapproval throughout. He uses it actually twice here. He uses it at the end of verse 35, and it, it shows up in, in uh, our translation, some of them in the beginning of verse 36 with the, the, uh, the word or. It's really this little word a. Should be translated certainly not, or rubbish, or um, get out of here, or something like that. But then he says, I'm going to read it like Paul wrote it. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law says. By the way, Paul was an Old Testament scholar. He was a Pharisee. He knew the Old Testament. He knew the law. He knew that women were not silenced in the law. So Paul could not be saying this because there's nothing in the Old Testament law that has, says anything about women being silent. So that is another proof that he's quoting what they said. What law could they be referring to? Well, there would have been some, they were mostly uh, Gentiles, Corinthians, Greeks. There would have been some Jews in their uh, midst because he started his ministry in the Jewish synagogue. So this could be from the Jewish oral law from the rabbinic traditions, which Sue has shown in her book, In the Spirit We're Equal, she has documented, was, was very demeaning to women. So it could be that they're quoting, the law they're referring to is out of the Jewish oral law, rabbinic law, or they could be referring to some of the pagan Gentile laws, Roman laws, which were also demeaning to women. But certainly this is not Paul because Paul knew full well the Old Testament law did not silence women. And so this is further proof that he's actually quoting what they said. And so let your women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something let them ask their own husbands at home for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Rubbish! <laughs> he says, did the word of God come originally from you? And then he uses that little A again, that, that exclamation of disapproval. Certainly not. I don't think so. Certainly not. <laughs> In other words, they're acting like it all started with them. <laughs> hey, listen. There are ministries today, churches today, they act like it's all started with them. <laughs> well, well, we'll put that little exclamation of disapproval that Paul uses. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> you got to be kidding. And so Paul uses it twice. At the end of his statement at verse 35, and then when he says, did the word of God come originally with you? A, absolutely not, certainly not. Or was it only to you that it reached? Yeah, that's the truth. The word of God has reached to you. It didn't start with you, 
but it has reached you. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. And so my friends, based on the, old, the testimony of the Old Testament, based on the testimony of Jesus and the Gospels, based on the testimony of the promise of Pentecost that a day was coming that would be inaugurated by the Messiah when all the limits would be removed from the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, no longer limited to some special people, some, some uh, special prophet or judge or king. No, the time was coming. The limits would be taken off. And all of God's people would be recipients of the outpouring of God's Spirit, sons and daughters, men servants and maid servants. And they would speak, they would prophesy. If Paul wrote that, Paul is not a follower of Christ. If Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35, then Paul is not a follower of Christ. But Paul was a follower of Christ. Paul gave his life to follow Jesus. I am totally, absolutely convinced that Paul, just like he has done throughout this letter, that he's responding to something they wrote. And he quotes something they have wrote about women being silent. And he says, rubbish. He says, get out of here. Mm -hmm. However, that would have been translated in the first century. An exclamation of disapproval as one of the very eminent, maybe the largest Greek, most thorough Greek English lexicon out there puts it. An exclamation of disapproval. Paul made it clear that he disapproved of that statement that had come from the Corinthians. So my friends, I hope you get this. I hope you will take this outline. I hope you will listen to this teaching again. Make your own notes around it. Make this yours. This doesn't belong to Eddie Height. This is truth that needs to be out there. And do you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32? If you continue in my word, he said, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. This truth tonight will set people free all over the world. All races, all denominations, if they can hear this, it will set them free. Free indeed. This also goes right along. I need to leave this with you. What we have been doing tonight, 1 Timothy 2.15 Paul said, study to show yourselves approved. Some of the newer translations say, be eager. Or in other words, we could say, be diligent to show yourself approved of God. A worker who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What Paul shows us here, if we rightly divide the word of truth, it is going to require some diligent application, some eager, diligent application on our part to get to the heart of the truth and to rightly divide the word of truth. I, I, am, I am settled before God. My heart, my conscience is clear before God that we have rightly divided the word of truth tonight and that Paul here quoted mm -hmm. something that the Corinthians had written in their letter to him mm -hmm. and he expressed an exclamation of disapproval not once but twice in that very verse so may God help us and may God use this International Christian Women's Hall of Fame. That's why God has raised us up. Yeah, I preach and teach about other things. In fact, I feel that God has given me a calling 
to be a part of calling America back to its Christian roots and seeing another great revival in America. But let me tell you this, there's not going to be another revival unless we get a hold of this truth so that the entire body of Christ can be released, that each member can function according to their gifts and their callings. We're not trying to push anybody out to do anything they're not called to do, they're not gifted to do. But what we want to do, we want to provide a biblical justification for you to do. If you are committed to Jesus Christ, whether you're a man or a woman, then you can go out and you can be settled that you are, have a justification from God's Word to do whatever He has gifted and called you to do and thereby see the entire body of Christ mobilized and rise up and reveal Jesus to this modern world. The, church has, the world has seen enough of religion. The, church doesn't, the, the world doesn't need to see another institutional church. They don't need to see another religion. But the world does desperately need to see Jesus. And oh, how we need to see the body of Christ mobilized, not according to gender, but according to the gifts and callings of every member of Christ's body. If you are a member of Christ's body, He has put gifts in you. I want to ask you tonight, we were talking about this, this is so important for us to see all that God wants to do. Have you received that promise of Pentecost? Have you received that baptism in the Holy Spirit that was promised in the Old Testament that would be a part of the coming of the Messiah? The coming of the Messiah would usher in this whole new area, this whole new area of this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Have you accepted that? Have you had that upper room experience? Have you followed Jesus? Maybe you've been like one of those disciples and followers. You haven't been fully obedient. Maybe you haven't followed through. Maybe you're like those 380. You found that there were other things that distracted you and you didn't make it to the upper room. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you tonight, it's not a geographic location. You don't have to go to Israel. Yeah, I was there in the upper room in Jerusalem. Had a prayer service there. It was a great experience, but I can tell you, I've had greater experiences of the Holy Spirit in little churches in Northeast Texas, on rice paddies in India. <laughs> Because the upper room is not a geographic location. It, 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 it's the hunger of the heart. And you can come right now to the upper room. Say, God, forgive me for being distracted. Forgive me for not following through and obeying you in every detail. And God, I want that promise of Pentecost. I want that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to fully function in what you've gifted and called me to do. And, and, and Luke said in, in Luke chapter 11... If an earthly parent and a child ask them for a fish, mm -hmm. they won't give them a snake. If they ask for bread, they won't give them a stone. Mm -hmm. And Luke said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And I just want to wrap this up by giving an invitation to all of us that we will come right now in the Spirit into our upper room and say, God, baptize us afresh with your Holy Spirit. <laughs> hey, you may have already experienced it. I'll tell you in Acts 4, those same people we read about in Acts 2, they were together in a house. It wasn't in the upper room. It, was a, it just says it was a house. And they were praying because the authorities were threatening them and had commanded them not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says men and women... They gathered together and they poured out their hearts to God. And the Bible says the place where they were gathered together was shaken. That, that was something didn't happen in the upper room. You know, there are things that can happen, fresh things. 
the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. They all, again, men and women. That's why Paul targeted both men and women. That's what... That's why Saul, that was before he became Paul. Even before he became a believer, Saul knew the prominent influence of women in this Jesus movement because when he got authority from the high priest, he made sure that he had authority to arrest, the scripture says, both women and men. He knew he could not shut down this Jesus movement, this messianic movement by just targeting the men that he had, to, he had to target both women and men if he had any hope of stopping this Messianic Jesus movement. Yeah, Paul knew about the, the prominence of women in this Jesus movement even before he became a follower of Jesus. So there is no way Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Mm -hmm. All of the evidence points, even the evidence of the letter that he quoted. That he, he included it, but it was a quote. He included it for the purpose of refuting it. He included it for the purpose of refuting it. So let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, this is our upper room tonight. Lord, you have called us to get this message out. I mean, this is just a little part of it. But you raised us up. You raised up Sue. And you, in, in such a marvelous way, you've raised up this place right here on Main Street in Grapevine. And by the way, those of you in the Dallas-Fort Worth area want to invite you to come out. Be with us on Tuesday night. Let's fill up this room with a live audience. You're welcome to come. Father, we, you've raised us up for such a time as this to get this message out to the whole world. God, I thank you for all the friends out there tonight. God, we want all you have to give and we recognize, Lord, we can't do this without you. We can't do this without the empowering of your spirit. And you've promised, Lord, the empowering of your Holy Spirit. That's what the promise of Pentecost is all about. Lord, we come in our upper room tonight. and We come, we say, Lord, fill us full and afresh again. Fill us full and afresh again with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We acknowledge we need you, Jesus. We, need, like, we say like John the Baptist, we need your baptism, Lord. We need your baptism, your filling of the Holy Spirit. God, that is the only way, Father, we can fulfill your will, your plan, and your purpose. So I pray, Lord, for ourselves gathered here in the hall. I pray for all those gathered online and those who will, who will view this archive. God, I pray tonight that you will fill everyone who sees this program Fill us all full and afresh with your Holy Spirit, I pray, O God. Empower us afresh. Shake us once again, O God, with your presence and your power. And send us forth as your passionate witnesses. I pray, Father, and I thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. And I want to lift up a song, Sue, unless you have, but you go ahead if you have something. You know, I know that God is working tonight. I know His presence is here. So I just want to get my guitar out. And I guess the only thing I would say is, Eddie, that's just so powerful. And, and it's available. People can take this into their home group, into their Sunday school. They can, they can use it because yeah. it's so clear to be delivered from the confusion of these two passages um, for our entire Christianity because um, I believe this was the enemy that was r lying and deceiving the Corinthians, but it was meant for the f to divide, continually lie about these things. Mm -hmm. It was from the enemy is what I see yeah. it as, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, the enemy has used that. Yes, very much for to, division. To, to silence half the body of Christ. Yes, or yes, more. or to cause disarray or yeah. confusion. Um, even in for the marriages, this has been harmful. And so it's a, it's a clarity of truth, you know, like you said, rightly divided the word of truth. Yeah. Um, it has to be known because even families and marriages are affected by this uh, lie.
so this is very crucial. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Lord, to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, the ruler of my heart today. <laughs> Lord to me. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It all goes back to Jesus, goes back to the Gospels. He is Lord. Sing this with me. Wonderful worship chorus. Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me. Master, Savior, Prince of Peace. You're the ruler of my heart today. Jesus, Lord, to me. Going to sing it one more time. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, to me. Master, say. Your Prince of Peace, the ruler of my heart today. Oh, Jesus, Lord, to me. Let's pray for Victor, Sue. See, Victor's a part of getting this message out. God has raised up people. Hey, uh, uh, you know, apart from our efforts, and, and uh, Victor, this medical doctor from Kenya who's translated your little book, Ten Things Jesus Taught About Women, because he sees it is so important for his nation. And so let's pray that God will open doors, bring the connections to get this out in Swahili, all over Kenya, all over Africa, everywhere Swahili is spoken. Father, thank you for Victor and his wife. And God, I just ask you for a special blessing tonight on Victor and his wife, Lord, open the windows of heaven upon them. Bless them, Lord. Give them divine connections, Lord, for getting these books out in Swahili. And Lord, I'm sure that there are many people right there in Toronto. It, it's such a cosmopolitan city. There are many people who speak Swahili there. And so we ask you, Lord, to make the connections uh, of, of this book now, 10 Things Jesus Taught About Women. Get it out, Lord, in Swahili. There in Toronto, in Africa, and wherever you would send it, we pray. And I just, Lord, I just pray a special blessing. Just a special blessing upon Victor and his wife. Lord, thank you for raising them up. Hallelujah. And partnering with us in getting out this message. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and amen. Well, it's been a good evening. Are you looking at any comments or anything, Susie, or do I need to put my computer on? Okay. Just chill. Just chill. Um, talking about when you mentioned Toronto, I, I, uh, my heart, uh, something's happening in my heart. Okay. I don't know what it is. It's interesting, uh, Irene, you were born in Toronto, probably went to school in Toronto, yeah. My brother lives in Midtown at uh, Eglinton and Young Street. Uh, he has a condo there. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to miss whatever it is. Oh, that absolutely Why not. my heart is, um, why I'm experiencing whatever this is. I don't understand it. Uh, but, um, I, I, it could be intercession. Why don't you just release it soon? No, Let's no, it's, it, no, it's just, uh, that's why I didn't want you to go too fast because yeah, it's just uh -huh. so gentle. It right, just, um, okay. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Uh, I care, you know, I care. Let me see. Channel sure, one see. here. Yeah. I well, care Lord, we pray for about Canada. And that's why I believe God told me to start the Christian Historical Society of Canada. And I just haven't been able to nurture it. 
Um, but I received a message this week from one of our friends in St. John about some horrific things that are going on amongst the Muslim immigrants. 13-year-old girl being married in a, she actually goes to Princess Elizabeth's school where I went to school and this little girl lives down the street from where I lived, you know, when I was like eight till 14. My, my street, and this is happening on my street, animals being sacrificed in backyards in my neighborhood, are you kidding me? And it's like, I remember going to New Brunswick, even, even on ter Toronto area, a few years ago, just sharing the Christian roots of Canada. And I stand by that. Canada, like America, was formed on biblical principles. The nation of Canada was built on biblical principles. And, uh, you know, I was amazed at how uninterested my fellow Canadians were at that time. But so much has changed in just that, what, five years. I think maybe, you know, there's a wake-up call. I think there's a wake-up call. And I know there are sincere believers in Canada who are praying for the nation, just like sure. Americans oh. are praying sure, for the nation. Sure, so absolutely. I'm not dismissing that. Yeah. But I see a, I see a wake-up call. And part of the, the thing is, you know, if the gospel is going to bring, if, if we are going as believers, if we are going to bring the culture of heaven to earth, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus taught us to pray. I see that in terms of thy culture come to earth. God's ways and means come to earth as they are in heaven, in Canada, in the U.S., mm -hmm. in Ireland and England and India and New Zealand and all of the nations that are represented amongst us here. Um, part of the message has got to be the restoration of what Jesus and Scripture teaches about the equality of men and women in every respect that we're to function not on the basis of roles imposed by, gen by fallen culture, but we're to function by the leadership of the Holy Spirit according to the gifts and abilities and personalities that God has given each one. Yeah. And it's a terrible thing when women are pushed down, pushed aside um, by the church. Mm. Um, there was something there that there was a discussion on live stream about uh, how very often in Bible school for example where many young women go be not to find a husband as has been suggested by many but because God called that woman to go to Bible school and prepare to serve him and I did that and it cost me everything cost me absolutely everything and I don't regret that yeah but I know that even throughout my 17 years of higher education that there was a a way of treating women that was different from the way that men were honored and treated mm -hmm. and it was uh, was tough it was you know it, it's been tough but I don't bemoan that because I know God has commissioned me. I know He's faithful, and it's such a blessing to me to hear you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> really get it. <laughs> and get it across. Yeah, because this is probably what you're talking about. Is these scriptures are is 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 one of the biggest lies of the culture. Is what we're talking about tonight is what you're saying. It's destroyed so much, but not anymore, because by the power of truth, There's we a lot of people overcome. commenting on uh, uh, face. I, I won't read all of them, but uh, Laura Uptegrove uh, is on. Fern Chapman, 
firing way up in Nova Scotia, and Linda's commenting more. Laura Updegrove is in uh, Springdale. Uh, Fireseeker, who is Fireseeker? Uh, Fireseeker's been on the floor, but Fireseeker, I've forgotten if you want to tell us who you are, but if you don't, it's okay. Tara Chambers in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But Tara, so good, glad you're with us. Uh, Tom and Sue Wood and uh, Laura Updegrove says, what a message of freedom. I hope everyone who grasps this is motivated to pass it along. Yes, yes amen. amen. Uh -huh. And Sue Wood says, awesome message. That message, I pray, will set many women and men as well free to obey Christ. Silent no more. Yes. Well, you know, Sue, God has raised you up and you have been faithful and God now has mm -hmm. is, is bringing things together and we're sitting in this mm -hmm. renovation here over fifty thousand dollars completely paid everything current but I, I do want to say that you still need partners for the Hall of Fame because God has come through in unusual ways, like a one-time gift or me getting an invitation to speak somewhere, getting an offering. But there is still a need for there to be partners for this, for this ministry, for the Hall of Fame. And so if you believe in what we're doing, even $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, $100 a month, hey, somebody said one time, drops of water combined together create a flood that cannot be resisted the great floods in houston it was an accumulation of many drops of rain so hey if if you can even give five dollars a month to the hall of fame that will be appreciated and it will be accumulated together with others and help meet the monthly budget so i'm just going to throw that out to you and, uh, and no, no pressure, because we look to God as our source. We seek to live by that, to look to God as a source. But I wanted to let you know that there is still a need for more partnership in order to meet the monthly budget for this Hall of Fame. But praise be to God, everything is current right now. Hallelujah. And we're com com confident God will continue to provide. Uh, and can is on. And Sue, uh, you might want to check Facebook. I know Rhonda is there, but she's not able to tell us what people are saying. So um, on Facebook, there are some comments that are going on. I think we should all be controlled. I'd just like to add, you know, living in this uh, planet, um, we are all seeing the warfare going on in our country and, and the warfare on um, Sharia law that is against the, mm -hmm. the equal oh, yeah. uh, of the woman's equalness to the man and that while that is escalating trying to take over God is going to escalate more yes we have to believe that the truth that women are free and at liberty as he has called man the the man species or the man uh, so I just kind of see tonight's overall huge um, exciting news is that our truth tonight that you taught tonight is going to help our country and our gospel overcome what is trying to be set right. against us yeah. absolutely well said very Amen. well said. Excellent. Thank you, Linda Miller, for your statement. Uh, Linda was just affirming what I said, and she wrote a thing on. Uh, 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 yes. Okay. Live stream. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank um, you, Linda. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But remember too, Irene, that if you have a a, a phone, you can interact with people either on live stream oh. or on the phone. On Facebook, oh. even while you're sitting there. While I'm sitting. Oh, okay. Okay. You can, you can I just have to bring my laptop. You can do it with your laptop. Okay. Okay. Or you can do it with your phone or, or, or my iPad, phone. Okay. Any All right. of those devices. You can okay. actually interact with okay. VR. Okay. Well, with these what people. I'm enjoying and drinking is uh, what I need to focus on is the, the class itself. 
for now because that's what I need right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah, and I appreciate the um, options, but, but um, and also uh, also when others come, mm -hmm. yeah. just know just know okay. that you can do that as well. You can do that as well. You're okay. free to Thank do it you. if you want to. Appreciate it. Okay, Eddie, we're a bit over tonight. So okay, we'll we go off with this song again soon. Jesus, Jesus, Lord, to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, the ruler of my heart today, O oh, Jesus, Lord to me. Let's sing it one more time. And Jesus, Jesus, Lord to me, Master, Savior, Prince of Peace, the ruler of my heart. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, this will be on YouTube later, so share it. Let's get the message out. Pardon? Oh, it, it'll be immediately on live stream. And Facebook. Yeah. And tomorrow we will put it on YouTube. Right.